I'm very grateful to Ura for inviting me to speak on the all-important subject of happiness. Simcha Sachayim, the joy of a Chaim. Chaim is an interesting word, it's really plural. There's no singular version. The word Chai is an adjective. Chaim literally translates as lives. So actually, Simcha Sachayim refers to being happy in this world in preparation for the next. The problem is that's a little bit exclusive because it's only those who are really part of the Torah in this world are really investing in Chaim, the world to come as well. So Ura is special because it's inclusive. It's looking out to make sure that Jews who would otherwise be assimilated have a chance to be part of Simcha Sachayim. As you know, Ura runs two summer camps every year, a Kirov camps. They have 35 chill zones. What are chill zones? That's where kids meet every single week and learn with volunteers. It's a chill zone because they chill out with pizza afterwards. 35 of them throughout the whole of America. One of the biggest aspects of Ura, as you know, is paying for Jewish children who would otherwise be in public school and have no Jewish education whatsoever to actually be part of a Jewish school. That's incredible. Your, your Mekayim Nefesh Achas, there's no word there that says Matzil, save a Jewish soul. It says Mekayim. You are maintaining that the Jew should not get lost. He stays with his identity. That's Kiyum. Ura also makes sure that any graduates of their own schools, they have one in Staten Island and they have uh, throughout the whole country, they get Jews, Jewish children, students into Jewish schools. If they graduate, go on to Eretz Yisrael, they're taken care of over there, whether it's Shidduchim, even internship amongst the many different offices that Ura has. These boys and girls are able to get internship. They actually apprentice in jobs that they can then get in a from environment. That's amazing. It's incredible what Ura is able to do to inject Jewish identity in children, teenagers, and give them meaning so that the parents end up coming along as well and you change families that way. It would be worth it just for one neshama, but you're doing this for thousands and thousands and thousands. And you have Torah mates, 5,000 pairs of Jews who are learning with volunteers and that's throughout the whole country. This is an amazing organization and that's why I'm extremely happy to be speaking on behalf of them. So the subject, Simcha Sechayim. Well, let's ask the obvious question. Who is responsible for my Simcha? Who's responsible for my happiness? I think you all agree, it's essentially me. Okay, thank you for coming, are there any questions? Okay, it sounds simple. I'm responsible for my happiness, right? Everyone agrees? Okay, fine. Then can you relate to the following? You know, when I graduate from high school, I'm going to be so happy. You know what, when I get, I'm go on my first date, I'll be so happy. When I get out of this shit, I'll be so happy. You know, when I get my first job, I'll be so happy. You know, when I get out of this job, I'll be so happy. You know, when I get married, I'll be so happy. When I get divorced, I'll be so happy. When I have children, I'll be so, when I get out of the house, I'll be so happy. One second, one second. If I'm responsible for my happiness, why would I play the game of when my boss shows me more appreciation and gives me a raise in salary and then I'll be happy in this career? Who have I set up as responsible, controlling my happiness, me or my boss? If it's my kids who have to show me more appreciation and respect in this family, you know, one hour of your chutzpah is more than I ever had in a lifetime to my parents. Now, there's no one here who can really relate to any of that. Some of you have friends who know what I'm talking about. When I blame my kids for my unhappiness as a parent, who have I set up as controlling my happiness? Me or my kids? So who's responsible, me or my children? Oh, it's interesting, you know, as much as I admit that I'm responsible for my happiness, I so easily fall into the trap of the blame game. What's the blame game? Well, when you are more respectful and appreciative in this marriage, when you're more respectful as a child to your parent, uh, when you show me more appreciation in the job, when I get more clients, when I move house, when I get to that zip code, then I'll be happy. You know, when I lose weight, then I'll be happy. You know, when I uh, can afford to build an extension, then I'll be happy. And listen carefully how I have set myself up for paying attention to what's good in my life now, or am I constantly telling myself when I lose weight, when I get married, when I, get, when I have kids, when I get them out of the house, when I move to another zip code, when I change communities, when I get a new chibros, and I constantly make happiness a moving target. So we're going to look carefully at Simchus Chaim. We're going to put it under the microscope because 
We're living in a very interesting time in history, Jewish history, history in general, where I don't think there's been a time in world history, and you tell me if you agree, where there has, there's more information on the subject of marriage than any time in world history. There are professionals, therapists, there are seminars, there are CDs. Um, wouldn't you expect from all the books written on the subject and all the experts and, and all the information that's now available on the dynamics of a husband and wife that was not available to our parents, grandparents' generation, wouldn't you expect with all that information there'd be much more clarity and therefore happier marriages? And yet, what's the actual outcome? What's the real outcome of this? Is there more clarity and therefore more happiness because of that clarity? Or do we discover that divorce has never been higher in world history? Well, how about the subject of raising children? <laughs> um, someone asked me if I ever hit my kids. I never, never, ever hit my kids. Except in self-defense. Um, it's pure humor, no reflection on reality whatsoever. Uh, has there ever been a time in world history where there's more information about how to raise our children? It's incredible. And yet, can we boast for all that information, and the seminars, and the lectures, and the educational consultants, and books galore on every single period of our children's growth, and their interaction with parents and peers? And we've got so much information. Can we claim that we are happier in raising our children? You see, something is very missing. There's a serious gap over here. You can take any subject you like. It could be health, it could be finances. In the area of health, has there ever been so much information on nutrition, health, diet, exercise? And yet, can we boast that we are healthier than any other time in world history? Uh, look at finances. We've got the most opportunities ever. We've never had so many millionaires, multi-millionaires, billionaires. And yet, can we actually say that we're enjoying more from our money? than any other time in world history? Or could we say there's never been more stress related to financial pressure, no matter how wealthy a person is, and there's never been more pain in marriage, more pain in parenting, and something is really amiss? What's that gap? You'd expect from that information, clarity, more happiness. And yet that's not the result, that's not the outcome. So part of this is really to ask ourselves, how do we close that gap between the information we do have, the clarity that, is, that does exist, and all the blessings that we have. I mean, just take for example, have we ever had a time in world history, and this is my last question on this part, has there ever been a time in world history where we enjoy so many comforts, luxuries? You take a king or a queen of a hundred years ago, they did not have the comforts and luxuries that we have today the opulence that they enjoyed in their massive palaces, they still didn't have air conditioning. Their carriages, horse-drawn, uh, did not have air conditioning and did not have shocks in the tires. They didn't have tires. So, you know, you're talking about a world where you would expect, oh my gosh, we actually enjoy more comforts and luxuries than kings and queens of 100 years ago in so many areas. The, the question begs, are we much more happier because of it? And because of that gap, we've got comforts, we've got the luxuries, we've got opportunities, and yet somehow or other, the happiness we would expect that's correlated to all of that is not there. The equal sign is not there. What's missing? We have more kashras and more clothes that's appropriate for from Jews to buy, restaurants that we can go to. We, we, we've got so much organized religion. We've got choirs and we've got CDs and DVDs. Of, the Jewish life is becoming so rich. There's an explosion of information in the Judaica stores. And yet, can we say that we're enjoying happier lives because of it? Or would we actually be able to say there seems to be a correlation between the increase in everything that's good in our lives, and yet there seems to be an equal increase in fallout. Kids disenchanted by Yiddishkeit, whether they are teenagers or whether they are young marrieds with several children, also wondering, why am I from? Why should I stay from? And they're not happy in Yiddishkeit. Is it possible we've got more diseases, Rahman, Ratzlan, related 
to cancer, heart disease, that's correlated to diet and lifestyle, and the unhappiness that comes with that pain. Oh my gosh, so how do we explain what that gap is about? How do we close it? So I'm not gonna make this complicated, I'm just gonna go back to real basics. And that is really, here's the starting point. Is happiness a mitzvah? Well, interestingly, it's not one of the tariag. You will not find in Rambam or Sefer Chinuch or the Smug. Uh, you won't find any of them actually listing the mitzvah of Simcha as one of the 613. However, Rabbi Avram Kramer, the brother of the Vilna Gon, uh, quotes in his brother's name in the Hagdama, the Sefer Malas Atera, that there's unlimited mitzvahs in the Torah, billions and billions. Uh, so even if you want to say that Tariag does not include the mitzvah to be Simcha, it's definitely an era, a dear Isa. It's definitely a dear Isa. Even if it's not one of 613. Then the question might be, well, how come if it's such an important mitzvah, why isn't it one of the 613? Duh. So I'm going to give you a very simple analogy. And I'm going to expand on this and help us build the case for what Simcha really is. You get a check. And it's from, I don't know, someone called Bill Gates. Uh, when he was worth about $100 billion. And the check is made out to you personally for $50 billion. You're sure this is some sort of hoax, some sort of mistake, uh, and there's a note with the check that comes in the mail and says, um, I have faith in you, I trust in you, I like you, and I think that you're gonna do good things with this money. So you, it, it, it must be some sort of scam or something, but you sign the back of the check, you endorse it, and put it in the bank, and it clears. You are now worth $50 billion. Bill Gates um, contacts you personally to make and tell you, I want, I'm happy you got it, and I just want you to know it's yours. Now, um, you ask in return, mm, I'm very grateful to you, I really am very grateful to you. I mean, it's a, it's a, I could probably do, I could, I'm probably gonna get the most Alam Haba anyone ever has had, because with $50 billion, do you know how much I can do to help the yeshiva world? How much I can do for almanas? How I can do it in the, in the shidduch scene? I mean, there's so many incentives I can create. For, and and I'll, it's just it's un unlimited. Unlimited what I can do that you're giving me the opportunity in this world and the next. I'm so grateful to you, Mr. Gates. Um, is there anything that you're asking for me in return? And he says, uh, no, not really. Um, now imagine this. He says to you, actually, there's one thing. I would like you to be happy. And you say back, you gotta be kidding. <laughs> uh, you gave me $50 billion, that's, that's, it makes no sense for you to ask me to be happy. Oh my gosh, <laughs> you made me the happiest person in the world. I can't even run out of this money. Even if I, I conservatively invest it, uh, only part of it, that's gonna continually prepare, that's going to continually provide uh, substantial income and all the other billions, which I don't need, I can, I can save the Torah world. I can bring Kirov to a whole new level. So listen how absurd it is that Mr. Gates would ask you to be happy after he gave you such an incredible gift. So now, what's the nimshal? In the analogy, it's very simple. You, yes you, won the lottery. Much more than $50 billion. You won the lottery because you're born. Yeah, there's, I'm not going to go into the biological statistical chances of you being born, but actually, if you really look into it, you'll see that that was a miracle on its own. So you won the lottery of all the chances of you not being born. You were conceived and you were born. Lottery number one. Number two, born healthy. Oh my gosh, really? You're born healthy and you're still healthy? You won the lottery again and you're still winning it. Number three, you're born Jewish. Whoa, one second and from, or you became from, or even if you were from, but you felt like an empty shell and culturally religious because you were raised this way, but had no meaning to why you were, and then you started going to, I don't know, Shi'urim, uh, reading books and became newly inspired, and you learned a lot of hashkaf and gave you a whole new injection of Ava for Hashem and his Torah and his mitzvahs. So, oh, you're born and you're healthy, you're born Jewish and you're from, oh my gosh, You've won four lotteries so far. <laughs> you are 0.23% of the world population. As a Jew, you are one person out of over 7 billion. You are 0.23%.
of the world population. 0.23%, you are less than a quarter of 1% of the world population, and you are born into Asher Bachabanu Mikol Amin. Hashem selected us from all the other nations. Oh, and he actually asks us, please, Bachata Bachayim, choose lives. Yeah, the word Chai is an adjective. It's not the singular version of Chaim. Chaim means lives. Yeah, this is about preparing this world for Erlana Emes. So let's now go root to root basics on the midst of Simcha. Is Simcha what happens to us? Is it really our health that helps? Is it really our finances? That kind of helps. Is it family? That helps a lot. Um, is it um, having a beautiful home? It helps. Is that really Simcha? Because if it's Tali Badava, if my happiness depends on my marriage, my kids being really good, um, my health and my finances, then Has Shalom, if any one of those are removed, what's going to happen to the Simcha? It gets diminished. Can that be real Simcha? So, Here's the obvious question. What does it mean? What does Simcha mean? You can translate it as happiness, but in Lashon Kaidish it's a perfect language. So let's put the word Simcha under the microscope. Let's put the word Simcha under the microscope and see what comes up when you turn up the magnitude. Oh, Simcha, says the Baal Shem HaKadosh, is made up of two words. Sham, Moyach. There's your mind. Happiness is what you're thinking. Happiness is a choice. Oh, so it's, it's not my house, it's not my um, wonderful devoted husband or, or a devoted loyal wife, it's not my kids. He, 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 no, those are all bonus. It starts with number one. What am I thinking? What am I focusing on? To prove to you even more that Simcha is correlated to our mind, not our health, not our finances, all those are bonus. It's not family, it's not the zip code, it's not your career, it's not how much money in your bank account, all that's bonus. Simcha is as simple as being happy because of what you think, what you focus on. And that proof is, the very word ber Simcha is the, grammatically, the word you say in the present tense of being happy now, ber Simcha. You're in happiness. That same word, Ber Simcha, shares the exact same letters, says the Arizal, as Machshava. What's the correlation? Well, it's obvious. Where is your happiness? In your pinky, your elbow, your kneecap? <laughs> no, happiness is a choice you make. And what is that choice? To enjoy the good Hashem's already given me. Let's see if that's really true. You see, even though it's not one of Tarag Mitzvahs, and HaKadosh Baruch says, look, I gave you life. I've given you health. I give you, you're born Jewish, you're from, you've got mitzvahs, you're, you're investing in Ulama Emes, you've got everything going for you. Um, do I also have to tell you to be happy? It's, it's like a king gives you everything you need. Or Bill Gates give you a $50 billion check. Does he also have to say be happy? You've got to be out of your mind to have to tell me that if you've gifted me so much. So comes along Kaj Baruch that even though it's not commanded as one of the Tariyag, it is nevertheless commanded in the Torah. Where do you find it commanded? It's many places. Number one, Be happy with all the good. Before we finish the Pasuk, if Hashem is telling me, it's in Perk Hafav Pasuk Yud Aleph, in Pasuk Kisavai, Besamachta Bechol Enjoy all the good. What's the assumption? What's the predicate in that statement? There's good to be happy about. And Hashem is telling me, pay attention to that. Mr. Machta, enjoy. Kol Atayv. How much is Kol? 95, 97, 98, do I have? It's 100%. Enjoy all the good. Asher Natan, Lecha Hashem Elokecha. That Hashem has Natan. Natan is a language of Matana. It means gifted. Enjoy all the good. Hashem has gifted you. That's the mitzvah of being Basimcha. There's another place which is even more telling. And that's also Parashas Kisavai, Perak Hav Ches, Pasuk Mem Zayim. Very famous Perak, the most probably most depressing, painful chapter in the entire Tanakh. Perak Hav Ches, with all the Teichachas, you add on from Parashas Bechukas, you've got a list of 98 Klalas that uh, Has Vashan would come upon Klal Yisrael. For what? Yes, our disobedience, but I mean... Uh, any, any clues? Yeah, the Torah goes out of its way in Pasuk Mem Zayin to give a quick insert. Why should Hasva Shalom, all these calamities come? 
And the Kodesh Baruch spells it out. Of all the things he could have chosen, it's Loshon Hara, Sinas Chinam, those are bigots. Gaiva, whoa, that's a terrible, terrible, terrible middle. Cast, horrific. Um, he could, Hashem could have selected a ton of really bad ones. Jealousy hit the top 10. Uh, that's in the top 10 of the 10 commandments. Aseris Adibrais. Hakadosh Baruch Hu chose the following. Tachat Asheloi avadat et Hashem elokecha besimcha. Oh, in place that I didn't enjoy being from. Now, I know that's my translation, but look at the words. Tachat Asheloi avadat et Hashem elokecha besimcha. I wasn't enjoying doing your mitzvahs, serving you, davening, learning. Now, does that mean if I don't understand my davening that I can be simcha? To some extent, but really helps to know what I'm saying. Uh, it doesn't preclude you from the original mitzvah there, right? So of tefillah, which was 1-800 Almighty. Just open up your mouth almost anywhere and talk to God is Baruch Hu, and praise Him, thank Him. That can take a long time. And then get to the bakashas, the other part of the structure of tefillah, three main parts. There are others as well. Ahavas Hashem is another part of tefillah. And the recognition, this is for us to come to on our own, that the Kodesh Baruch Hu loves us. That's what Hashem really wants from tefillah. But that's something Hashem wants me to be basimcha about. Chesed. Birkas HaMazon. Birkas HaShacha. He wants me to be basimcha when I'm doing his mitzvahs. If it's Bein Adam Makam or Bein Adam L'Chaveroi. So comes along the Torah and actually spells out, even though it's not one Tariag, it doesn't need to be, because it's so obvious. Hashem says, you know what? Continues the Pasuk. These are three parts here. Number one, we said it's and that means I'm paying attention to the good that's in my life. I'm paying attention to the good that's in my wife. Paying attention to the good that's in my spouse, in my house, in my health, in my wealth. I'm a poet, and I know it. Just joking. So, comes along the Torah and tells me, number one, has for sure, all that would come because I was not enjoying being from. Number two, betuv levav. Got to look at that. And number three, meraiv kol. From the abundance of everything. Says Rashi, what does it mean, meraiv kol? Be'oid shechaya lecha kol tuv. While I had the good, I wasn't enjoying it. I wasn't paying attention to it. What was I paying attention to? Everything that I don't have yet in my life. You know, when I, when I get more money, then I'll be happy. You know, when I lose weight, then I'll be happy. You know, when I, when I uh, vacate on that island, then I'll really be happy. You know, when I get a new car, then I'll be happy. When I move to that zip code, I'll be really happy. You know, when I get to the next marriage, then I'll be happy. And when I have children, then I'll be happy. You know, it's just, I'm not counting what's already in my life, I'm counting what's not yet in my life. And what's not yet in my life, there's plenty and always will be much more than what I have. So happiness is counting what I don't yet have, or is happiness counting what I do have already? So claims Rashi, but he's actually quoting the Medrash, while I had it good, I wasn't counting it. But to Vlevav, very important words. Lev, unfortunately, we follow. Um, I don't want to say King James Bible translates the word Lev as heart every time. Throughout Tanakh, the word Lev has four meanings, so we really need to identify which one of those four the word Lev means in every pasuk that it turns up. Um, the word Lev, first and foremost, the vast majority of times, and when I say majority, it's well over nine, well over nine times out of ten. So it's more like 95 out of 100. The word Lev means mind. There are many, many psukim that demonstrate that. The Vilna Gon, in Baba Kama, Daphne and Hayes says, if you want to know the meaning of any letter, find where it first appears in the Torah at the beginning of a word. The same is applied to, if you want to know the meaning, of, if you want to know the meaning of any word in the Torah, find where it first appears in the Torah. Because the context of that word will give you a clue as to its meaning. Oh really? Where's the first time the word lave appears in the Torah? And the answer is, Perak Vav Pasuk Hay, in Parshas Bracious, right at the end of Parshas Bracious, Vayara Hashem, Avayara Kim Hashem saw ki rabba rasa Adam. The negativity of mankind was rabba, abundant. The kol yitzah and all the design machshavos libai. The thoughts of his mind rak rak kol ayom were negative all day. Where did you do your thinking? In your mind or your heart? In your mind. Oh, so leiv over there clearly means machshavos libai. In 
the mind. We say every morning in the liquid of Psukim, before Psukim de Zimra, uh, we quote from Mishlei, and we say, uh, I think it's Perek Tesvav, I believe, where we say, Rabbeis Machashaveis Belevish. Rabbeis Machashaveis. There are many thoughts, Belevish. Where do you do your thinking? In your mind. There are many, many examples of that throughout Tanakh, that when you correctly translate the word Lev as mind, not just changes the meaning, changes your mind. It actually changes your hashkafa. Lotisna et achicha bilvavecha does not mean don't hate your brother in your hearts. Bilvavecha is plural. So, because um, there's lev is one and levav is referring to two. That's what the Radak tells us whenever the word lev is doubled over. You'll find that in Sefer Haredim Perakhes as well. Lev means one mind, levav means thoughts. So levavcha, your thoughts. So, don't hate your brother in your thoughts. Because if you don't stop thinking negative about your husband, about your wife, about your kids, about your mother-in-law, sorry, just swallowing. Um, if you don't stop thinking negative about your career, or about your health, or about your brother-in-law, your father-in-law, or your chibusa, or your neighbor, or the community, or the leadership. Uh, have I covered everybody? Oh, sorry, your client and your co-worker and your boss covered everybody? Okay, great. If I don't stop thinking negative about them, guess what's going to happen? I'm going to start feeling really hateful, resentful, bitter, angry. And now my emotions, Hasb Shalom, control my mind. And now I hate you even when it's clear that I misinterpreted, misunderstood. It was a miscommunication. Or I really didn't understand where you were coming from. And if I heard your story, um, it would be very easy for me to be done with close. So it comes along the turn and tells me, be very careful. Don't trust what your mind tells you. Because your eyes don't tell the truth. Don't follow your thoughts in your eyes. Really? Well, whose thoughts am I supposed to trust if I can't trust my own? And the answer is... I'm supposed to fill my mind with as much of Hashem's beautiful terror, which is his mindset, so that I start looking at the world through his lens, not mine. So that my eyes don't look at the world as the world projects itself. Hashem wants me to see the world through his eyes. And therefore, is, is warning me to take control of my mind. Because simcha is a choice I make in my mind. And if I watch a lot of bad news every day, if I surf the net and... Or sheva, or yeshiva news, which, which, guess what they're selling? Good news or bad news? Just be honest. Most of the time, is it good news or bad news? Just be honest. Yes, most of the time, it's bad news. So what's going to happen if I'm overexposed to a lot of negative news and I hardly hear much of the good because it doesn't sell as well as the bad? Guess what's going to happen to my expectations of my own morality and other people's? Gets higher or lower? Gets lower. And what happens to my sensitivity to Averus? If I hear about it again and again and again, my sensitivity of the original outrage switches to, oh yeah, again, oh yeah, again. And I start becoming insensitive to very serious Averas. And more we are exposed, the lesser are our expectations in society. And the negativity starts to sabotage the good that's already in my life. But oi, jahai alakha, kol tu. While I had it good, my mind was paying attention to so much negativity that guess what? This gap starts to get real. The gap between the reasons for me to be happy equaling happiness gets sabotaged by this big gap in the middle called bad news. Paying attention to the negative in other people. Well, shouldn't I do that to protect myself? Well, look at the Torah. Ask the Torah, what does it want me to think? So, so we have a strange mitzvah. Uh, you'll hear why I call it strange. Now, there's nothing strange about loving your fellow, but look at the language. Why does the Kaddish Baruch Hu use the language? Please love. What's the two-letter root of Re'acha? Ra. Oh, one second. Re'a is referring to your neighbor, to your friend, your companion, or someone who you're 
have compatibility with, but the two-letter root is Ra. Ra means negative, evil, bad. Rabbein Shalom, why did you choose that word? Says Rabbein Yaina, Shah Gimel in Shari Teshuva. There's no mistakes in this language, it's a perfect language. Akadosh Baruch Hu wants us to know that if you're looking for a friend who has nothing negative in them, how long will you be looking for a friend? If you're looking for a spouse who will never disappoint you, never upset you, never make a mistake in the marriage, how long will you be looking or how long will you stay married? If you're looking for kids who will never mess up, always respectful, disciplined, never make... It's not realistic. How, how happy will I be with my children? See, the Hafta Lareacha Kamecha claims Rabbeinu Yaina, a Rishon, that the whole purpose of Achdus is where we coexist with the differences. So that means to say that just as I'm accepting of myself with my inconsistencies in my personality and my weaknesses, <laughs> plenty of mistakes I've made in the past, and a track record of mistakes in certain directions, and yet I'm still capable of loving myself. Oh yeah, so then, Kamoicha, just like I am that way with me, I need to be at least that with you. You see that the mitzvah actually predicates, assumes that I have a mitzvah to love me because it says Kamoicha. I should love you like I love me. Oh, so I have to love myself first. Yeah, but how can I love you if I know all these negative things about you? And comes on the turn and tells me, but that's, the mitzvah is not to love someone who's only got good in them. The mitzvah is to dafka love them even with the negative. And still love them. Does the Kaddish Baruch Hu reject us when we do Averis? Or he gave us a mitzvah of Teshuvah? What's that predicated on? What's that assuming? I'll make mistakes. He gave a mitzvah of Yom Kippur. That's a whole day dedicated to cleaning up my mess. Teshuvah. He's given us, in the time of the Beis HaMikdash, loads of different karbonas. Karbon Chatais, Karbon Ayla for um, Hirhurim. Uh, he gave me the Asham, Asham Talay, Asham Vadai, this, this, uh, even the Sanhedrin brought a carbon if they passed incorrectly, which would cause Jews to do an Issa of Karis. That would be the response of, whoa! I mean, the Torah, Hashem's mind, anticipates, expects you and I to make mistakes. And some of them are really serious. And because it expects us to, he gave us a mitzvah of Teshuva and Yom Kippur and several Kabbanas, which are completely related to the mistakes I've made, Bemezid Beshoigeg, so comes along the turn and tells me, happiness is not dependent on my behavior. Happiness is not dependent on my marriage. Or, hey, it's good. If you've got a good marriage, there's more reason to be happy. Happiness starts super simple. You know what that is? Born. Alive. Jewish. From. And we say it every morning. We thank Hashem for the most posh things, the most simple blessings we are grateful for. Why don't we just say it once at Bar Mitzvah, Pukeach Ivrim, thank you for my eyes. Why don't we say it every day? Zeikiv Kufafim, thank you for my spine, my spinal cord. Um, every single part of my body is connected to my spine and my nervous system, um, all the sinews and muscles and ligaments, everything is all super connected through this network that is supported by the fact that you can control your spinal cord, really? So you have to say that every day? Yeah, because I might take it for granted. Oh, really? Yeah, I might forget. Life is really good, really good. Um, thank you for my clothes, thank you for my wardrobe, thank you for my shoes, Shahsali Kol Sarkiv, you provide me everything, really? So I'm thanking Hashem, every day for the $50 billion check he gave me at birth, which is worth more than $50 because I'm born, what's life worth? Hey, <laughs> there's no price. So comes along Chazal and initiate for us to remind ourselves every day of the obvious. Thank you for my brain. Listen, if the rooster is being praised, we're praising our Kodesh Baruch not the rooster, uh, because it's got a brain that can distinguish between day and night, no matter where it is, even underground, they've done experiments, and the rooster will still cock a doo the same moment of dawn. My gosh, remember, you gave such incredible insight to the rooster, how much more so should I be grateful for the brain you gave me? Thank you for making me a Jew. There's so much to be grateful for. So comes along Shlomo Malach and tells me, Hey, got a hundred. 
Are you happy with the 100? Roid Sematayim, he wants 200. One second, let's figure this out. I got 100, but I want 200. So am I happy with 100? Well, if I want 200, I guess I'm not really happy with 100. Um, when I get like 180, 190, 195, 199, close to 200, I start to get really happy, right? Roid Sematayim, then I'll, then I'll really be happy. Uh, not quite, because when you start getting close to 200, you start realizing how expensive your spending power is, your influence, how much more you can do if you had more. Um, so you start saying, oh my gosh, if I had 400, I'm not sure if you appreciate this. You see, 200, um, it's, I'm just about getting by, but if I had 400, oh my gosh, I can consolidate all my debts into one debt and then I pay it off on a lower interest rate over time, that, that would be amazing. And as soon as you get close to 400, you realize, oh my gosh, if I had 800, now listen, I, I'm very serious, I work so hard. If I had 800, I could put money down on a second home, what a blessing it would be to get away on the weekends. I, you know, I, have, no, I have no idea how hard I work. And before you know it, it's 1600. And what's Shlomo Melech warning me? Because Shlomo Melech wrote this Baruch HaKadosh, that means, it's not a statistical analysis or popular opinion that he says a person has 100 wants 200. No, he's telling you HaKadosh Baruch Hu wired us to want more. So is that a problem, wanting the more? And the answer is not intrinsically, not at all. So what Shlom HaMalek is really saying is the following logic. I have 100, but I really want 200. One second. If I'm not counting the first 100, in my life. Where's the logic that dictates that when I get 200, a bigger home, better career, um, finish this PhD, um, improve the marriage. If I'm not counting the first 100 in my marriage and in my intelligence and in my career, where's the logic that dictates that when I get 200, then I'll be happy. I'm not enjoying the first 100. So what Shlomo Melech is really telling us is the secret to happiness is enjoy the first hundred. Now when you say right sema time, that's not a problem, you still count the first hundred, but when a Kodesh Baruch does bless you with 200 or 400 or 800, you'll count that as well. You'll count that too. Because your mindset is paying attention to the good that's in your health. That's what all the blessings already in your life. And that's why we're saying Birkas Ashaka every morning. That's why we bench Birkas Amazon every single time we eat bread. That's why there's so many blessings for so many occasions, so I don't forget to pay attention to what's happening in my life now. Because if I get fixated on advertisements, commercials, pop-ups, which are all predicated on the same assumption, you can't possibly be happy with your wardrobe. You can't possibly be happy with your weight. You can't possibly be happy with this car. You can't possibly be happy until you're driving this car or smoking this brand or drinking this drink or wearing this hair cream, perhaps not in my case, uh, until you're vacating this island. You can't possibly be happy until you have this product or service and then you'll be happy. And children who are exposed to any form of media where they've got these pop-ups, on average, are exposed to a quarter of a million of these every year. Which means the mind of the children and then adults is being trained to pay attention to what I have now or what I don't yet have. Oh, by paying attention to what I don't yet have, I'm training my mind in unhappiness. I'm training my mind to pay attention to what I don't yet have. And happiness is not that much complicated then. Sameach, shamayach, where's the mind? Oh, it's over there. On where, Where's there? Whatever you're focusing on. So if I'm focusing on the negative, I'm unhappy. If I'm focusing on the good, I'm happy. Grateful people, happy people focus on what's good in their lives. And if I'm ungrateful and unhappy, it's because I'm focusing on what's not good in my life. And comes along Kodesh Baruch Hu, and he warns me right at the beginning of the Torah. Right at the beginning. Kodesh Baruch Hu creates the world in six days. The whole universe, six days. That's pretty impressive. He creates man on the sixth day. He creates him in the third hour of the sixth day. Gemara Sanhedrin, Daf Lama, Daf Lama, sorry. Gemara Sanhedrin, Daf Lama Ches. He creates man on the third hour of the sixth day. Fourth hour, Nisrat Boi Nishmasai. Fifth hour, Amad Baragla, he stands up. Sixth hour, he names all the animals. Seventh hour, he gets married to Chava. Eighth hour, they have children. Ninth hour, he's commanded, don't eat from the tree. Tenth hour, eats from the tree. Eleventh hour, he's judged. Twelfth hour, thrown out of Ganadin. Next moment, end of the day, comes in Shabbos. At the end of every single day, a Kodesh Baruch gave a report. 
And he said two words, Kitai, missed out, second day, because splitting of the water, anything's supposed to be together, it's not supposed to be split, that's not good, so he missed it out. But he doubled it over on the third day, so he made up for it. But when it came to the end of six days, end of six days, because this is by era by Boike, we're talking about the end of each day, he gave the report, now he's, and now Kodesh Baruch gives his final report. Vayar Hashem Elokim, uses both names, whoa, this must be serious. Yud Kei and Elokim. Okay, what did you see, Kodesh Baruch at Kol Asher Asa, everything he'd made. Vihine, and behold, behold means pay extra attention, that's what Hine always means. Toy, it's really good. Now if Hashem says something's good, it must be really good. But he didn't stop there, he said, Ma'ay, it's exceedingly good. Exceedingly? Eventually, you gave this report at the end of the sixth day, Adam, the purpose of creation, just blew it. And he set back the clock, now we know nearly 6,000 years, how can you say it's really good? And the Kodesh Baruch says, Oh, you're reading the bad news. <laughs> Don't get stuck on the bad news. I created Teshuvah before I created Adam. A human being can change in a second. One hearer of Teshuvah, Billy Boy, in his mind, can change his entire slate. New start. Because Baruch says, Don't worry, man is capable of changing. And so it's really good news. The world is beautiful. The world is really beautiful. Even though man is thrown out of Ganadin. The world is really good. Yeah, set back in health. Yes, set back in finances. Lots of problems. <laughs> Every single one of the most greatest, outstanding personalities throughout Tanakh had lives saturated with adversity and challenges. And the Sion is ad ain safe. Anyone you want to take. Sarah Menu kidnapped twice, barren 90 years. But she would say of her life, Kulan Shavin Latoma. Her whole life was equally good. Really? Equally good? And you say, Sarah, how can you say that? You were kidnapped twice, barren 90 years, you went through almost all the nations of Avram Avinu, you took on a co-wife, how do you say that Kul and Shav in the Taiva? So Sarah Mena would tell you, that's not what I was focusing on. Look, don't just read the bad news. If you have to read the bad news, because the Torah does report it, barren, kidnap, Amimelech, Parai, read the good news too. I was mother of Klal Yisrael. I'm the Amu the Amunda. I'm the pillar that brought Yitzhak Avinu into the world, upon which the moon of Klal Yisrael stands on the Imahos, on the Avos. Oh, ask David Amalek. He, he suffered more than Eiv. Chazal tell us he suffered more than Eiv suffered the most in the 12-month period. David Amalek suffered the most over a lifetime. And yet, you go through whatever he went through, rejected by his father, rejected by his brothers, his own wife Michal, who was devoted and completely loyal to her husband, misunderstood who she was married to, saw him dancing Besimcha, wild in front of the Aaron, for he was denigrating himself in front of the maid servants and servants, uh, by far not the case. He was in love with the Kodesh Baruch Hu. She lost the right to have a child in her lifetime. She died in childbirth. David Amalek was not even appreciated by his own wife. How about his father-in-law? <laughs> I'm trying to assassinate him a few times. Well, how about at least getting some nachas from Kindler? He lost four boys in his lifetime. Amnon, Avshalom, the son from Bathsheba. Adon Yehu asserts his authority at the end of his life. He suffered terribly. And yet, 150 love songs of praise and thank you. And the words that ring out the most echo again and again. I do. Thank you. Really? You? Suffered so much, you're saying thank you? For, for what and to whom? Lashem. Really? After all you've been through, Darun Malach, you're going to throw in the towel? You're grateful? You're happy? How do you do that? Kitaif, because Hashem's good. Can't you see how good the world is? Pay attention. Says Rebbe Shalem, look, it's Taif Ma'id. Now, if Hashem's good is good, what's the Ma'id? Oh my gosh, it's exceedingly good. Darun Malach saying, Hashem's good. And how do you do that, David? And David Amalek will answer her, Well, when I'm finishing pouring out my heart about the pain in my life, my soul drips with agony. He pours out his heart to my Kodesh Baruch Hu of all the pain and agony he's going through. And David Amalek says, After I finish telling Rebbe Shalom the bad news in my life with my wife and my kids and the kingdom and everything I'm going through, I figured, look, if I have a right, it's a big if, if I have a right to tell you what's not good in my life, I should follow my own logic, be consistent, and tell you what's good in my life. So he switched to listing Hashem's chesed, and then, ki le'olam chastai. It's unlimited. There's no end. David Amalek 
lived in reality. He wasn't a pessimist when he said, my soul drips with agony. He wasn't an optimist when he kept saying, when he kept saying, I love you, Hashem, thank you. He was just a realist. That was reality. He says in Perak Dalet Pasuk Ches, Natata Simcha Philippi. You've already given happiness in my mind. Oh, happiness is already there. How much do we experience? As much as we're paying attention to. In the schus, in the merit of knowing that Ura, its light, that's what Ura means, the light of the Torah, is what gives us the clarity to realize life is good. Hashem, you want me to be happy. You've commanded me to be happy. You didn't count as one six thirteen because it's so obvious you want me to be happy. You give me a fifty billion dollar check. You're not giving me Alam Hazar, Alam Haba. You, you've given me everything that I am. I owe you everything, Hashem, and you owe me nothing, zero. In the source of knowing, the Ura is helping bring about what Sarah, Imenu, Avram Avinu were doing in bringing. People under Kanfei Hashkina. May we all be zayicha to march simcha in our lives with our families and with our children. Ad bias hamashiach b'mir amenu. Amen.